Hi everyone, this is Cassius from Loss and Hope Coalition Project with the Church of England. Um, he's here to talk to you today about practical advice and the theological aspects of bereavement. So I'll pass you over now. Hi, it's um, really great to have the opportunity to uh, just share with you uh, briefly for uh, this, this morning. Um, as Alana said, Loss and Hope is a coalition project. Uh, we partner with organisations called uh, Care for the Family and also um, Together in Hope. And we are really um, keen to raise the issue of how um, uh, people in, in general, uh, but specifically for this morning, uh, you as Christian students can uh, be involved in supporting those who are bereaved or even uh, supporting people who you may be concerned about uh, within your own networks and circles. So you can find out uh, more about uh, what I do through Loss and Hope uh, via the website uh, Loss and Hope. Dot org that's lossandhope.org but we also have uh, the national signposting uh, website called atalos.org uh, atalos.org and that's for any person who is bereaved to be able to access uh, personal bereavement support and also access counseling uh, via a web chat service if they uh, if they would like uh, to do that. Alan has just asked me to uh, share a little bit specifically uh, about my work, but I'm, I'm really keen to make this uh, conversational and to give you an opportunity to ask any questions that you would like to. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk for maybe 10 minutes and then I'll pause. Uh, and check if you have any questions. I'll keep looking at the screen. So if you want to stop me as we're going through this, um, I'm also happy to, to pause and take questions as we go. And if you prefer not to uh, speak, uh, you can always type in the chat and I can uh, pick questions up that way. I think firstly, I'd like to start by saying that um, grief is something that is, is natural, um, it's unavoidable, and it's a human response to loss. It's necessary. Uh, loss needs to be processed for a healthy life. And it will impact all of us sooner or later. I don't know whether any of you have experienced bereavement personally. Um, but it, the, the reality is that in, in life, we will all be impacted uh, by losses at some point or another. And it's a roller coaster of unpredictable thoughts and reactions with lots of change and adjustment. So there's no set way of grieving or going through bereavement. Uh, there are different models that um, we present through our training. Uh, to give people some sense of, you know, the different feelings that they may encounter or, or they may see in somebody else that they are trying to offer support to. Uh, but there's no set, set pattern uh, for how we each uh, grieve. It, it is an individual experience and it will be different for each of us. It can affect every aspect of a person's life. So it's not just their emotional well-being, but also there can be huge practical implications uh, when we experience a, a bereavement. It can also affect our physical health, our mental health and our relationships. Bereavement is often cited as one of the most stressful times in life. And for many people, it can go on for a very long time. It can be devastating, leaving uh, people feeling as if they're not functioning and as if life is falling apart. 
So that is why uh, we've tried to invest a lot of time in uh, talking to churches, uh, talking to Christians, followers of Jesus, wherever they are, uh, particularly around the UK, about how they can be involved in supporting people uh, that they uh, are concerned about regarding uh, bereavement or someone who might have experienced a bereavement so that they know where to be able to access help and support if they need it. And you might be, you know, particularly interested from the perspective as uh, students um, about the context for this work. Um, I was really saddened to read as I was preparing for this earlier today that one uh, UK student dies by suicide every four days. Uh, in, this is in the UK. Um, and the majority of those students are male. Um, the last student that I was reading about uh, this morning was from Oxford University. He had trained as a doctor and he was suffering with long COVID and ended up taking his own life and recognizing that the stage that we are at coming through uh, the COVID-19 pan pandemic means that all of us have experienced significant uh, changes, uh, but also particularly for you as students. I, I have uh, friends who are students. I know that you know, it has been a very strange time the last two years, trying to access learning, uh, trying to, you know, just navigate your usual studies and perhaps thinking that you had a clear plan. Um, you're going to go through this three year degree and then you're going to get into this job and do X, Y and Z. Uh, and that may feel as if there are lots of uncertainties currently regarding that situation. And and certainly from our perspective um, in the work that we do, um, I was very aware uh, that, you know, it, that increased uh, pressure and uncertainty uh, can sadly mean that, you know, lots of students feel under pressure. Um, and as I said, really saddened to read that statistic about suicide for students. So I really just wanted to, um, to, to, to say that as an organisation, um, we would encourage you as, as Christian students, please do uh, log on uh, to, to the website, uh, lostandhope.org, if you would like to actually do some further training for yourself to understand about how to support others, whether that's in your student Christian unions, uh, whether that is through your own churches or um, other groups, uh, because there are free resources that you can access and information uh, that you can share uh, for others. So Alana, let me, uh, let me pause there, because I think that's uh, about 10 minutes just to give you an opportunity if you wanted to ask me any questions and also for others that are on this before. Um, before I go on any further. So how do you think, not just students, but people of any age, you know, how do you think they should approach maybe grieving in a healthy way? Mm. Because often, isn't it the five stages of grief mm -hmm. that it's what's well, anger, denial, it's those ones. Yeah. So, so they're a natural process, they're not always healthy. Like often you find anger, sometimes it's anger at the strangers around you being like, why are you okay? Like, yeah. why are you not affected by the fact that this person isn't here anymore, even though obviously they didn't know them? Yeah. So yeah. How would you recommend, yeah, grieving in a healthy way? Yeah, that's a really, uh, a really great question. Uh, not a straightforward one to answer, but one of the, <laughs> the first things that I would say is recognizing that, that grief is 
a, a natural process, you know, that um, uh, emotions um, like anger, uh, like frustration, uh, feelings of denial are perfectly natural um, is, is the first thing that I would say, just recognizing those different aspects uh, in themselves uh, start the process of, of healthy grieving. Um, but I would also encourage sharing with others and talking as much as possible. Um, there's a, a short film um, uh, that you can access via the, the At A Loss website. And it, it talks about three things, contact, um, bless, uh, and also um, contact, bless, and for, I'm forgetting the, the last word now, it'll, it'll come back to me. But it, the, it's within the recognition that actually that contact is really important as a starting point. Um, not isolating yourself within grief, uh, recognizing that this is a natural uh, process, the feelings uh, are natural, and being able to connect with others and to share with others is, is a part of helping um, with the, the grieving process. The other word that I was trying to think about is listen, uh, contact, listen, and, and bless. Um, so finding those people who are prepared uh, to listen to you. Normally, you will be able to, to find those within your own uh, family, friendship groups, networks. Um, I, I know that sometimes within family, it can be quite complicated if there are other members of your family who are also grieving. You may feel that you don't want to burden them uh, personally. Um, but I would encourage you to, you know, to access uh, support and talk to people where you can. Um, as I said, if you know, if you don't have someone uh, within within your own uh, within your own networks, uh, the atalos.org uh, website does provide a a free web chat service where you can access counsellors, um, and it also signposts to lots of different organisations. Um, that you can search for locally and find people that if you're, you know, if you're struggling or if you know someone who is struggling, uh, can access further uh, support. Um, so I, I would start there in terms of healthy, healthy ways to grieve. Um, but that's that's a really great, great question, um, Alana. I I suppose the other thing that I I would add is. As a follower of Jesus, um, sometimes we, we may feel that actually we should be able to cope with grief, um, particularly if it's someone who is a Christian who has died. You know, we, we may um, have heard or feel, well, they're in a better place and all that kind of stuff. But the reality is that we still grieve. You know, we still feel it. I still feel it as a, a minister. Um, you know, when when I've had friends or, or family members that have died. Uh, so I would also say to, you know, be open and understanding um, that, you know, whether we are Christians or, or not, this this uh, grief process is, is a natural one. I can see uh, a hand up. I'm not sure if you want to just unmute and ask ask your question hi uh, um i have experienced like quite a lot of bereavement myself but i was kind of wondering what your thoughts would be on like how do you think like you should go about reconciling your faith with bereavement like kind of oh if god is loving how has this happened to me that kind of like how when you're kind of grieving to then find God in that how do you have any kind of thoughts on that I don't think I've yeah, uh, yeah another another really great question and, and one that I've um I've grappled with myself and and as I started to do more work with loss and hope that the helpful thing that I found is actually that lots of people ask these questions lots of people actually whether they have a faith or not, 
uh, will ask questions of God um, when they are uh, going through a bereavement. Um, I, I did tell Alana about this booklet. I don't know if you can see the cover, um, Faith Questions in Bereavement. It's by uh, my boss, uh, Reverend Callan, Cannon Yvonne Richmond Tullock. And um, let, me, let me just read you a paragraph um, from uh, this first section. It says, uh, it asks the question, God, are you there? And she says, she writes this, I find the most frequently asked questions in bereavement have to do with God. Those who've never thought about whether God exists can begin to wonder if God does. And those who have previously rejected God's existence can begin to feel angry and let down by God. They thought they didn't believe in. Perhaps one of the most surprising things is that for many people who have faith, God can start to feel distant. This can be particularly troubling because they expect God to be a source of comfort when going through difficult times. That happened to me. And this is Yvonne talking about her experience of the death of her, her husband, Simon. Um, Yvonne was a cathedral minister with what she would call a living faith. God to her was a wonderful, all-knowing, all-powerful being with whom she had a personal relationship through prayer. God felt close and was an almost tangible part of all that she did. But after her husband's death, God seemed to disappear and she found it hard to pray. This was accompanied by doubts and questions about what she believed and also reached, sat and although she reached satisfactory new conclusions, it was a long time before the sense of God's presence and prayers being heard came back. So yeah, really just in uh, addressing your question, I, I think, I think the first part, I'm not using your name just in case uh, you, you don't want it broadcast when this is, is shared. So forgive me for not, for not sharing it. Um, what, what I would say is that it, it's important to recognize that as, as Christians, we have to do some of the work around grief and bereavement as well, and not pretend that it, it will be really easy. Uh, because we have a faith, uh, even if our faith is is really strong, and I, I would have described myself as a person of strong faith when when I lost a close friend, actually, that, that led me to start looking into doing uh, some further work for myself, a bit more training, some more reading. Um, I my my faith was was rocked. Um, you know, we had uh, prayed for my friend um, who uh, sadly died of, of cancer uh, in in the end you know we are uh, a church that believes in healing and you know we prayed believing that my friend would be healed and you know God chose not to heal him um, and there were lots of people not just me who were devastated by that uh, because we felt that actually God, God would heal. Um, so there are lots of challenges, I think, uh, to reconcile in terms of faith and difficult questions. And uh, one of the things that I would also say in terms of our churches in particular and why we, we do the training that we do through Loss and Hope is when people have those difficult questions, it's important for them to have somewhere to go with them. Uh, if, if they don't have a space to discuss, you know, the feelings of anger that Alana talked about or the feelings of uncertainty that I experienced personally, the questions about where is God in all of this, uh, then we can leave people really uh, with unresolved issues around their faith. And so, um, 
yeah, I, you know, I would certainly encourage you to, um, to, to, to reach out and, and don't feel that you are alone if you are, you know, if you have significant questions about your faith as, as the result of, of someone who'd, who's died. Does, does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. And I think as well, like when I like experienced bereavement, I had people could be like, oh, you know, like like you say, assume that because you've got a faith, it's all fine. And actually, I think people saying, oh, it's OK, they're in heaven now was actually quite difficult when you're mm. when you grow up and then everything that you that firm belief you have mm. is then tested. You know, that has real life meaning for you now. Mm -hmm. It's got consequences because. Mm -hmm where you think of your um the person you've lost you know depends on your faith and so I guess it's like I think in the church like it would be great if people kind of had more understanding of actually like it's okay just to kind of chill out and be there for them as a person as we would for someone who doesn't have a faith mm -hmm. as well as praying for them and doing other things like that yeah really really great points one one of our partner organizations uh, care for the family actually um do, do a course as well and there's a section where they talk about you know things not to say and it, it, um, we can be really good unfortunately as christians at just saying things that are really inappropriate unhelpful cliches that aren't you know really going to bring healing or peace to someone who is grieving um so you know as as you said you know oh you know why are you upset they've gone to a better place you know you should just be you know happy and it you know the reality in my experience is is not like that um and and when i talked about that contact listen bless uh, one of the key messages that we try and get across to uh to christians that we deliver the training to is actually sometimes saying nothing is better and just being present is really important just being alongside people um so one of my uh, favorite scriptures is actually um the, the book of job and uh if you are unfamiliar with the story job uh, starts out as a really rich man has uh, a vibrant family, um, lots of land, lots of wealth. And, uh, you know, within the space of a chapter in the first book, everything is taken away from him. Everything, you know, goes. And he is also, you know, personally afflicted. His health is deteriorating. And what I find really interesting in the second chapter um, is when Job's friends arrive, they sit with him for seven days without saying anything. And I think that's a really important lesson for us as Christians to take note of, um, you know, that it's, it's not always wanting to or trying to say the right thing that is important uh, because we also know that lots of people will talk about, oh, uh, people avoid me um, because, you know, they don't know what to say. And so we encourage people, actually, it's less about what you should be saying. It's more about just listening and being present and alongside people. And the, the last thing I'll say just in relation to that is also trying to ensure that our churches are places where people can feel it's OK not to be OK. And, um, you know, again, we, we, we get information um, from bereaved people who come back and say, actually, church is just a really difficult place for me to go to um, for the reasons that you outlined in your questions. There's, you know, there can be an expectation that, oh, you should be happy. You should just sing the worship song. You should participate, you know, as, as you would have done normally when, you know, if someone is struggling with um, bereavement, then that that's going to be really difficult for them to do. So we also need to do some thinking about the, the environment of, of our churches. Thank you. That was really helpful. Okay. Bless you. Bless you. 
any more before I um, just go on with some a, a, a few statistics uh, about um, the the pandemic in in particular. Is that okay? Um, can I ask um, how would you make yourself sort of present as someone who wants to help someone who's um, been bereaved? And because I know when I was bereaved when I was younger, I kind of bottled it up and I wouldn't mm -hmm. want to put any of my grief onto someone. Yeah. Um, yeah. So how would you? Yeah. How would you let people know that you're willing to just sit there and be with them? And yeah. Yeah. Really brilliant question. Um, I think I've, I've learned over the years that we're all used to different and respond to different modes of communication. Um, so, uh, you know, in my early years of ministry, when I was trying to, you know, get things done uh, effectively, I was the master at writing brilliant emails and expecting that you know, when it was sent that all of the information was clear and, and would be understood. Uh, and I, and I, I learned pretty quickly that actually that's not the case. We all um, receive information and respond to uh, different modes of communication in different ways. So to answer your, your question, I, I think it is just letting an individual know um, in, in ways that are appropriate, that you're available for them when, when they're ready. Uh, some people appreciate cards. Uh, some people will appreciate a letter. Um, some people will appreciate a phone call or a text message or, you know, you reaching out to them via social media. Um, and, and others, you know, will just want some space at different times. Um, but I think the key thing is that if you are wanting to uh, support someone who, who is bereaved, just letting them know that, that you're available when they're ready and, and giving them that time. And, and it may be that um, they feel that, you know, actually you're a little bit too close to this, so I, I'm not really going to be able to talk to you. And that might be where you're able to say, well, I know, you know, that there's an organization like At A Loss, that if you, if you want further information, if you want to speak to someone objectively who didn't know the, um, the, the person who died, then, then you can do that. Um, but uh, yeah, but I, I would say just, just making yourself, um, le letting the, the, the bereaved person know that you are, you're available when they're ready is, is the most important thing. Thank you. Okay. So let me let me read you a few uh, statistics, and then I'll I'll go ahead. Go ahead. Um. So when I was a student, um, my mum and sister died, uh, six months apart. Oh, sorry. And I wondered. I wondered if you had any thoughts on um, what uh, people can do to support like friends of theirs who go through similar things whilst at university. So. What is it? Are there any? I mean, I have some of my own experience, but um, have you got mm. any advice for people supporting friends who suffer bereavement whilst they're at university? Yeah, again, really uh, great question, and and really sorry for your uh, your losses. Um, I think part of it, to be honest, is even forums like this and um, enabling students to be able to connect and to share. Um, so I, I'm suspecting that all of you are in different parts of, of the country. Um, one, of the, one of the benefits I would say of the pandemic, there haven't been many, but one of the benefits is that I think it's, it's forced um, us as Christian ministers to think uh, much more openly about how we can connect with people online and offer support via uh, networks like this in, um, in Zoom or Teams or whatever it is. Um, but I would also say that, you know, if you can find um, common ground with others who are at university, um, and, and they may not be university students, they might be in the, the local area where you are, um, you may find that helpful. 
Um, so it, it, again, without wanting to repeat myself or just feel as if I'm trying to sell um, at a loss to you, um, the, the, the value of it is that you can put in the postcode of, of where you're living, you can put in uh, the circumstances of the, the death of the individual, um, you can put in how they were related to you, and it will bring up uh, appropriate groups based on that situation. And through connecting with those organisations, they may be able to uh, offer support groups or networks or further information for, for, for support if you felt uh, that, that that would be helpful. Um, but I, yeah, but I, I appreciate that it isn't easy. And, you know, when, when I was at university myself, was in my final year, uh, my grandfather uh, died um, quite suddenly, uh, actually. I, I was away in London. Um, all of my family were, were in Birmingham. And I was, I was at the point of starting to work on my, uh, my final project. Um, so it threw me into a complete spin, um, trying to work out who to speak to, what to do. Um, tried the thing of, you know, just soldiering on and getting through and it, and it really didn't last very long. I ended up just having to take a break and, and coming home. Um, I think I learned it was really important to be upfront with uh, the university. Um, so that the tutors knew uh, what was happening. So I was able to get extensions uh, for the work that I was uh, trying to complete. Um, I, and there was a, you know, I, I appreciate that, you know, all individuals and the universities will be different, but I certainly felt uh, with my lecturers, there was a sense of, of understanding. I read an architecture degree. So part of my work, I had to go and pin up uh, my my drawings and have them pulled apart by tutors and other students. And I remember that the first um, presentation that I had to do after my granddad has di had died, I was absolutely petrified. Um, I just felt as if anybody that said the wrong word, I was just going to crumble. Um, but I really did feel as if actually the lecturers were really sensitive um to you know the fact that I, I was going through this bereavement and we're just grateful that i'd been able to to complete the work um so yeah there's there's something about being up, up front with the university and um and and i think also just finding finding people that you're able to speak to um it may not it may not necessarily be you know your student friends um, it may be people who, who are outside of uh, the student body just because I know that as a student I was very wrapped up in you know the deadlines and the work that I had to do as much as I wanted to be able to um, at that time if I'd have wanted to be able to support any of my uh, my friends or, or even um, wanted to receive support after the death of my granddad. I know that they were all wrapped up in the same deadlines that I would have been facing, and so it would have been it would have been really difficult. Um, so I, I I hope that helps in in responding. But please do come back to me if you'd you'd like more information. No, that's really helpful. Thank you. I mean, I had. A bunch of time out of university and mm -hmm. uh, away from campus i had to resit exams and do essays and all sorts of things i did i did graduate on time but i did say oh brilliant time. well done so um yeah i think just echo what you said about making sure that people like the people at the university are aware about what's going on yeah um, at my university you had special circumstances forms right you could fill out and yeah I think they were useful about say you were like a boundary between a two one and a first mm -hmm. if there's a special if there's something going on in your life that that can like tip the edge to mm -hmm. um it's kind of helping you know if, if you are on a great boundary you're not helping you kind of get the upper end as they take into account mm. these kind of extra courses. i wish i wish i was that clever i i didn't get anywhere near a first i have to tell you but, but well, um, yeah, I was, it's, <laughs> it's just an just example that. of that 
I think yeah, yeah. It's, it's useful for boundaries. I think yeah, if you are yeah, like, on yeah. the edge, yeah, and those things, you know, they can be like whether well, they weren't having to deal with all of this extra stuff on top of their uni work, mm. then they probably would. Their work could be that little bit better, and I think mm -hmm. that's that's how they explained it to me anyway. That that's what yeah, kind of yeah. how they 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 kind of use them and how they take them into account and. So, yeah. uh, and which which university was that? Uh, this was Aberystwyth. Right. Okay. No, it's, it's really encouraging to hear. And um, as I said, I suspect that there will be different experiences uh, depending on the university that you go to, depending on your relationship with your lecturer, depending on, you know, your confidence in being able to raise the issues, um, you know, so, that, so there's a whole host of things that will uh, that will come into it. And, and it and it may be that you know sometimes it's it's someone who who dies who you, you might not feel actually that you were that close to and you might be surprised how how it impacts you um, in terms of in terms of the bereavement as well but that's that's really helpful thank you for for sharing so let me just give you a few um, statistics um, there are around 600,000 deaths in the UK every year. Um, if we assume that just 10 people are significantly, significantly impacted by every bereavement, and there's normally an average of 50 people per funeral, then that's more than 6 million uh, people bereaved every year uh, before the situation that we're in now with the pandemic. Every year, there's a vast number of people who are bereaved, and, and that number is rising. And as, as you'll appreciate, and as, as you will have probably seen on uh, the, the news with the, you know, the reaction to um, what, what happened with the, the parties at, at number 10 and, and all of that, that there are a lot of people who were who are really feeling quite angry um, having you know lost loved ones during the pandemic who might have died in hospital that they weren't able to see or um, you know they weren't able to give their loved ones the funeral that they wanted because numbers were restricted and I think that's part of what is fueling a lot of the um, the, the backlash. Uh, against you know the uh, this the seeming um, uh, lack of of sticking to the rules um, by the prime minister and, and the chancellor, um, but I won't get onto my political soapbox because um, uh, that might be straying into territory that will get me into trouble. Just to say that um, we did notice a change in around 2017, the Man United footballer Rio Ferdinand, also Princes Harry and William, started to acknowledge the difficulties that they faced by being bereaved. And it was particularly important because these were, you know, uh, perceived strong uh, male role models, uh, Prince Harry especially, um, talked about his mental health not being faced up to. Um, and, and the challenges that he faced as a result of that. We would say that we think that began a change in culture in the media beginning to talk more about grief. And so there are um, some you know, higher profile campaigns now. There's Grief Awareness Week. Um, you may have been aware of the National Day of Reflection um, in relation to the pandemic. Um, a couple of weeks ago, the 23rd of March, marking uh, the first day that we went into lockdown. Uh, we had a special service uh, in our church to mark that occasion, and we know that many other churches do, and also have uh, special days. So there are um, services like uh, Blue Christmas services now, specifically thinking about those who are bereaved, um, all souls, um, thinking about those who, you know, who have passed as well. Uh, and even as we approach uh, Easter time, uh, one of the uh, articles that I've written, you can, 
and again get access to this on uh, lossandhope.org is is think just getting people to think actually we don't we don't just want to rush to the triumphalism of resurrection sunday it's important to remember you know the pain of good friday you know the the darkness of holy saturday um, as the whole part of easter story and i it, it feels as if there is an increasing recognition um, of the importance of those services of the kind of liturgy that we use of the kind of uh, worship songs that we sing uh, but we appreciate that there's still a lot of work to do so alana um i i think i've spoken for um a while again do you um do you want to come back with any uh, any other specific questions um not off the top of my head but i do think it was really valuable when you said about particularly for students at, like uni to yes like seek help among like friends but actually it's sometimes better to go outside of the uni because it is mm -hmm. quite an intense experience being mm -hmm. at uni mm -hmm. and sometimes you need someone who's not in that experience to say actually yeah uni is important but it's only a moment in time mm. like it's not going away if mm. you have to take mm -hmm. a step back then do that <laughs> and that's why it's also important to then tell the uni because then they can say actually yeah we have extensions and we have Things yeah. that help with the boundaries that take the pressure off like the academic side of it almost mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as well as like full interruption years and yeah. things like that yeah. so I think that was actually really valuable that mm -hmm. sometimes it's better to talk to people who aren't in the moment with you yeah 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 now that I, I I yeah I would just completely want to reiterate that um I think sometimes the feeling can take uh, you by surprise as an individual and it can take friends by surprise as well. So, you know, if you are, uh, if you're crying, um, if you're angry and your friends haven't seen you like that, they may feel as if they really don't know how to respond um, or how to support you. And so, you know, the, the more that you're able to invest in identifying um appropriate people who can uh, support you i think uh, you will find it, it it helpful if if you are particularly in to uh into research the church of england uh commissioned uh research last year and if if you google it you will you will find it or you you're welcome to contact me and i can uh, direct you to it it said that out of the 2008 respondents uh, representing the population as a whole, six in 10 experienced the death of at least one person during the pandemic where they would normally have gone to the funeral. Um, more than one in four had experienced uh, more than one death. Eight in 10 agreed that those grieving needed more support. And interestingly, 35% have thought about their own death, 26% uh, about whether there is life after death. And that's part of why we think it's really critical that our churches, um, that you know, followers of Jesus are, are equipped in thinking about bereavement support because there are uh, so many people who ask questions of life and um, uh, and you know, uh, ask questions about faith, maybe for the very first time when they are bereaved. 61% said that they thought the church should definitely offer a listening ear to those who wanted to talk about death and dying. 54% uh, said that they should definitely offer help to people about their grief. 50% thought the church should offer practical help. 63% thought that they should offer indoor spaces for quiet reflection regarding grief. 54% thought the church should offer outdoor spaces. Now, this is the bit that I think is particularly interesting uh, to you guys as younger adults. The survey showed how young adults are impacted by 
bereavement. Although the majority of deaths um, are and have been during the pandemic older people, as many as five in 10 aged 18 to 29 had lost someone close to them. And a phenomenon of lockdown is that one in four in this age group found themselves helping to arrange a funeral uh, versus one in 10 in the older age group. So, you know, we, we recognize through the work that we do that you as, as younger people, uh, amongst everything else that, that, you know, you've had to grapple with have also um, uh, had to, to deal with and are dealing with uh, the reality of, of bereavement and further support for uh, perhaps family and friends through through this pandemic. And so I hope that, you know, the, the time and, and information has been useful. Um, you can get in touch with me via the website, uh, lossandhope.org, that's L-O-S-S-A-N-D-H-O-P-E.org. And um, you, yeah, I will do my, my best to, to respond to you um, fully. I, I just work uh, two days a week for the organization. So apologies if it takes uh, a bit of time. Um, but yeah, I, uh, unless there are any, any final questions, I think that's, um, I think that's probably in, enough for this session.